a une traduction qui va être faite. So, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for being here uh, this morning. Uh, this conference, uh, entitled uh, The New Frontiers of Economic Research, uh, takes part uh, to the student track uh, organized uh, by uh, Laurent Simula, professor at the Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon, and are kindly uh, welcome uh, also by, by the school, the Ecole Normale uh, Supérieure de Lyon. The, the aim of this uh, conference uh, is to recall that economics is before anything else a social science, and that economics, politics, and society are intrinsically uh, related. So today we are pleased with us are uh, their expert opinion on the new frontiers of economic uh, research. So my pleasure to introduce them very briefly uh, by uh, basically uh, alphabetical uh, orders. So the first is Professor uh, Philippe Aguin, who is a professor and chair of Economics of Institutions, Innovation and Growth uh, at the Collège de France. Roger Guénery, uh, who is uh, Emeritus <laughs> Professor and Chair of Economics Theory and Social Organization, also at uh, Collège de France. Danny Roderick, who is a Professor of International Political Economy at the Harvard uh, Kennedy School. And last, Joseph Siglitz, who is a Professor at Columbia University, and he shared with George Akerlof and Michael Spence the two uh, 2001, a Nobel Prize for the analysis of markets with asymmetric uh, information. So, its speakers will have around 12 minutes that will leave them uh, also the opportunity to interact uh, about the different presentation, but also with uh, the public. So, today I'm basically the moderator of the discussion, trying to everyone to to keep the 15 minutes at least at the maximum for each presentation, but especially also your uh, focus uh, person. So please free uh, to send all location you may have to our special guest on these uh, free of charge cell phone numbers. Uh, that is probably uh, not behind me, but still at some point will appear. So and now I guess that he kept with all this information. Uh, I ask you, I ask that you give your full attention to uh, Philippe, Philippe Aguillon that will be in charge of the first uh, talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot for inviting me, uh, Laurent, and organizing this. Uh, it's a great honor to be with uh, uh, my friends, with Danny, Joe, and Roger. Um, so, I, uh, je vais peut-être parler en français, parce que c'est quand même un public français. Uh, donc, voilà. Uh, et je, je vais un peu raconter ma, ma propre expérience euh, d'apprenti chercheur. Euh, J'ai fait ma, ma thèse à Harvard en théorie appliquée, euh, économie industrielle et théorie des contrats. Et à l'époque où j'ai fait ma thèse, on pouvait facilement publier un papier de théorie appliquée, c'est-à-dire on, on a un problème, on fait un modèle et on se faisait publier assez facilement. J'ai pu faire ma thèse en trois ans, ce qui était assez rare. Maintenant, on ne peut plus faire une thèse de PhD en deux ans et demi, ça, maintenant ça devient très difficile. 
Parce que maintenant, la théorie appliquée, ça devient très difficile à faire, à publier un papier de pure théorie appliquée dans, un, dans un, ce qu'on appelle un top 5, c'est-à-dire les 5 meilleurs journaux euh, AER, euh, Journal Politique à l'économie, Restud, Econometrica. Si vous voulez des, publier des papiers dans ces journaux, c'est très difficile de se publier en théorie appliquée pure. Enfin, pure. Et donc... Euh, donc il faut de l'empirique, notamment sur la croissance, si vous faites un papier sur la croissance maintenant sans empirique, ça devient très difficile d'être publié. Donc, euh, mais je suis allé vers l'empirique, pas seulement parce que je me rendais compte que si je faisais juste de la théorie appliquée, je, ça ne suffisait pas pour me faire publier, c'est qu'il y a des questions vraiment en théorie de la croissance qui nécessitaient une réponse empirique. Par exemple, le lien entre croissance et concurrence. Est-ce que la concurrence est bonne ou mauvaise pour la croissance Les premières théories sur lesquelles j'ai travaillé vous disaient que la concurrence, ce n'est pas bon pour la croissance et l'innovation parce que ça réduit les rentes de l'innovation et donc ça décourage l'innovation. Or, il y avait des études empiriques, notamment par Richard Blandel, qui est à Londres, et d'autres, qui montraient qu'il y avait une relation positive entre concurrence et innovation, ou concurrence et croissance. Donc il y avait un divorce entre la théorie de l'époque et, et les données, et l'empirique. Et si vous voulez, l'attitude des théoriciens à ce moment-là, c'était de dire, j'ignore l'empirique. Tant pis, ces gens-là, ils sont dans leur coin, ils font leur régression, et nous, on ne s'en occupe pas, quoi. Et puis il y avait une attitude aussi chez certains empiristes de dire la théorie, on les laisse, c'est un peu des fous, et on leur laisse faire la théorie. Et nous disons que ce qu'on qu s'est dit, c'est que non, il faut faire dialoguer la théorie et l'empirique. Et maintenant, ça paraît normal en croissance. Tous ceux qui font de l'économie de la croissance maintenant font dialoguer la théorie et l'empirique. Mais à l'époque, c'était très nouveau. Alors nous, ce qu'on a essayé de comprendre, c'est qu'est-ce qui, dans notre modèle initial, ne marchait pas Qu'est-ce qui manquait pour, pour comprendre que, en fait, la concurrence peut être bonne pour la croissance. Et on s'est dit, ben oui, il y a évidemment l'effet que la concurrence peut décourager, réduire les rentes de l'innovation, mais il y a quand même l'effet que, moi, la concurrence me pousse à innover pour faire mieux que mon concurrent. Donc il fallait un modèle où cet effet qu'on appelle en anglais « escape competition » soit dans le modèle, et je ne l'avais pas. Donc on a dû reprendre notre modèle, l'augmenter, et il y avait différentes manières de l'augmenter, mais chacune des manières d'étendre de, de, le modèle avait d'autres implications, et on pouvait directement tester ces autres implications sur des données. Et du coup ça permettait de sélectionner quelle est la manière d'étendre le modèle qui, elle, résiste aux tests empiriques. Et donc, vous voyez, on partait d'un modèle qui n'était pas tout à fait au point, on l'étend de différentes façons, on est, chacune des façons a ses propres implications, qu'on peut tester empiriquement, et du coup, ça permet de sélectionner, de dire, ce modèle, ça ne marche pas, celui-là, ça ne marche pas, celui-là, il marche mieux. Et, et du coup, c'est comme ça que j'ai commencé à faire de l'économie de la croissance, tout, par un dialogue permanent entre la théorie et l'empirique. Et je, je fais les deux, je, je ne fais pas la théorie sans l'empirique, j'ai besoin des deux. Voilà. Euh, mais il y, y a des gens qui disent, moi, j'ai pas besoin de l'empirique. Et puis il y a des gens qui pensent que l'empirique, ça sert à rien. Il y a des économistes tout à fait distingués qui vous disent, euh, moi, je fais juste des données, moi, la théorie, euh, j'y crois pas. Et moi, je ne peux pas fonctionner sans ce dialogue permanent entre l'empirique et, 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 et le modèle. Et je reprends mon modèle, j'améliore mon modèle, et puis je retourne à l'empirique et je reviens au modèle. Voilà, et c'est comme ça que, que, je, que je travaille. Voilà. Euh, euh, et si vous voulez, il y a... Voilà, donc cette, et, et maintenant, ce qui est formidable, c'est qu'on peut, d'abord, la modélisation a beaucoup progressé, il y a eu des progrès énormes, il y a eu évidemment euh, tout ce, toute la révolution auquel euh, Roger et Joe ont participé, qui était la révolution des incitations, euh, de l'information asymétrique, etc. Il y a eu euh, une formidable explosion dans le domaine, en matière théorique, dans les années 70-80, euh, euh, mais maintenant, on a accès à des données auxquelles on n'avait pas accès avant. Et on a accès à des données au niveau des entreprises, on a accès à des données individuelles. Moi, par exemple, on peut suivre fiscalement des individus au cours du temps. Vous voyez, on peut voir le même individu au cours du temps. C'est anonymisé, hein. sinon on ne nous laisserait pas faire. Mais on peut, euh, on peut, par exemple, je peux regarder un inventeur. Quel est le revenu des parents d'un inventeur Quel est l'éducation, le, le niveau d'éducation de, de, de des parents de l'inventeur Quelle est l'éducation que l'inventeur lui-même a reçue Et donc, on peut essayer de comprendre eh ce qu'il y a un lien entre le fait d'innover et d'avoir des parents qui gagnent plus, ou qui sont mieux éduqués, ou qui, euh, etc., et de, comprendre, euh, et, de, et de comprendre un peu mieux ces choses-là. Il y a maintenant aussi des surveys. On peut, par exemple, euh, j'ai une collègue, Stéphanie Stancheva, qui a eu le prix de la meilleure économiste, jeune économiste, euh, en, du, du journal Le Monde et du Cercle des économistes, et euh, elle, elle peut savoir euh, la perception des inégalités. Vous savez qu'en France, par, par rapport aux États-Unis, il y a la vraie inégalité, 
ou la vraie mobilité sociale, et puis il y a la manière dont les gens perçoivent. Par exemple, ils se sont rendus compte qu'aux états unis les gens percevaient davantage de mobilité sociale qu'il n'y en avait vraiment. Alors qu'en France, on est plutôt pessimiste, on, perçoit, on a l'impression qu'il y a plus d'inégalités qu'il n'y en a vraiment. Alors essayer de comprendre pourquoi il y a ce, cette différence entre la perception et la réalité des choses. Donc maintenant on a accès à des données ou à des enquêtes à, à, sur des échelles tellement plus grandes qu'avant qu'on peut faire des choses formidables et on peut tester plein de théories. Alors j'ai créé, je ne veux pas rester trop longtemps, il me reste combien de temps Deux minutes peut-être Trois minutes 7, 8 Ah, oh, c'est génial, je ne vais pas les utiliser, comme ça je laisse davantage pour mes amis. Voilà. Donc, euh, j'ai, donc je suis revenu en France, et, et, et j'étais dans un département américain, je suis revenu au Collège de France. Au Collège de France, c'est un endroit merveilleux, donc euh, il y avait Roger, c'était très sympathique, mais j'ai voulu, j'ai voulu euh, créer quelque chose autour de moi avec, avec des jeunes. Voilà. Et ce que je me suis dit, c'est qu'avec toujours cette idée de faire dialoguer les modèles et l'empirique, on va créer un, un centre, un, un, un lab. Voilà. Moi, moi, mon bureau, je, je partage avec d'autres gens. Je n'ai pas un bureau à moi. Je, si vous venez au centre, vous verrez que c'est... Voilà, a, on est un peu partout, on est un peu éparpillé. Il y a beaucoup de jeunes. Et avec les jeunes, on, a, on explore la chose suivante. On a d'abord des données. Donc on a toutes ces données dont je vous parlais, des données de firmes, des données individuelles, euh, des surveys, etc. On, a, on essaie d'avoir des idées, hein, voilà, de les théoriser. Et puis de, d'intéresser des gens qui travaillent aux états unis en Angleterre ou dans d'autres pays, pour travailler avec nous sur ces choses-là. Et donc euh, mes étudiants deviennent immédiatement co-auteurs de personnes euh, que vous connaissez certainement, euh, Melitz, Van Rinen, euh, Stancheva, euh, euh, Aksigid, Benabou, etc. Et mes étudiants travaillent directement, euh, euh, Jaravel, euh, travaillent directement avec, euh, avec ces personnes et on collabore. Alors quels sont les genres de sujets qu'on regarde ben, Par exemple, le lien entre commerce international et innovation. Est-ce que le commerce est bon ou mauvais pour l'innovation Et pourquoi c'est bon pour l'innovation Les exports ou les imports Qu'est-ce que, voilà, donc on, on sait la théorie vous dit que eh bien, le commerce, ça, ça fait que vous, pouvez, vous avez un marché plus grand, et donc si vous innovez, eh bien, vous avez des rentes plus grandes à l'innovation parce que le marché est plus grand. Mais le commerce, c'est aussi plus de concurrence. Le commerce, c'est aussi davantage de ce qu'on appelle des externalités technologiques, de transfert de savoir. Eh bien, ça, on peut le tester. On peut, avec les données, essayer de voir est-ce que ces trois raisons, est-ce que c'est, est-ce que c'est vrai dans les données Donc ça, c'est tous les projets qu'on fait avec Melitz, avec Marc Melitz, et, et des étudiants qui commencent maintenant à devenir très très bien là-dessus. Infrastructure, ce jeu, qu'est-ce que ça a, quel effet ça a sur l'innovation, de, de mettre une nouvelle ligne, de, de, créer, de créer une nouvelle route, ou de, de mettre des, des, un lien Internet, etc. Euh, par exemple, fiscalité, ben, par exemple, maintenant, comment on peut suivre les gens au cours du temps On peut voir l'effet de différentes réformes. Par exemple, les grandes hausses d'impôts de 2011 et 2012, est-ce que ça a un effet sur l'innovation et sur le, la création d'entreprises. Ben on peut regarder ça maintenant. On a les données pour le faire. Euh, par exemple, quel est l'effet euh, ben Justement, ça c'est approche avec euh, Céline Antonin qui est là, et Xavier Jaravel et Simon Bunel. On regarde l'effet de la robotisation et de l'automation sur l'emploi. Est-ce que la robotisation, ça détruit forcément des emplois ben Nous, on regarde sur des, des données, de, de, on a des données au niveau des établissements. Et on montre qu'en fait, sur chose surprenante, eh bien, les, entre, les, les, les établissements qui robotisent et qui automatisent plus créent des, davantage d'emplois au lieu d'en détruire. C'est par contre ceux qui, qui ne robotisent pas qui, qui se font évincer du marché. C'est intéressant, c'était pas, ce qu'on a, c'était pas du tout ce qu'on pensait. Donc on est, on est en plein dans cette... Et je crois que Céline, tu en as parlé hier dans une conférence. Voilà. Donc ça, c'est un truc qui est fascinant, le lien entre automatisation et, 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 et emploi. Euh, on regarde par exemple euh, le lien entre innovation et inégalité. Est-ce que l'innovation, ça crée de l'inégalité et, et comment Quel genre d'inégalité ça crée Par exemple, ça vous amusera de savoir que l'innovation, les rangs de l'innovation augmentent les inégalités en haut mais n'augmente pas l'inégalité globale et augmente la mobilité sociale. Ce n'est pas évident. Voilà, ça c'est des choses... Qu'on... La réglementation, vous savez les seuils par exemple, vous savez qu'à partir de 50 employés, les choses changent pour une entreprise. Comment ça affecte l'innovation, ces, ces seuils c'est, voilà, c'est de, là, et plus généralement comment la réglementation influence l'innovation donc ça c'est quelque chose qu'on a aussi des données pour le faire euh, euh, on peut regarder également les, les réseaux d'innovation vous savez on est, il y a des réseaux on, on interagit avec des gens est-ce que j'ai envie tout de suite d'interagir avec la personne qui est la plus centrale au réseau je fais ça avec Matt Jackson et des étudiants on a de l'empirique et de la théorie est-ce que je veux tout de suite interagir avec la personne la plus centrale du réseau Peut-être pas, parce que j'ai peur qu'il me pique mon idée. Peut-être mon idée, elle est encore embryonnaire, je veux la faire grossir, je veux la faire grandir petit à petit. Alors, est-ce que je vais tout de suite connecter avec la personne la plus connectée du réseau, ou je vais peut-être approcher le réseau par, le, par la périphérie et rentrer petit à petit 
voyez, donc il y a tout, et puis alors tout ce qui est le climat, par exemple, la transition énergétique, est-ce qu'il faut aller directement de, du charbon vers le renouvelable, ou est-ce qu'il faut des énergies intermédiaires comme le nucléaire ou le gaz de schiste Ça c'est des questions intéressantes. Est-ce qu'il n'y a que la taxe carbone pour pousser à l'innovation verte Est-ce que, par exemple, la concurrence a un rôle à jouer également Est-ce que les valeurs sociales, l'éducation a un rôle à jouer Ça on peut regarder dans les données, toutes ces questions-là. Et donc, euh, c'est ça que nous faisons dans notre centre, c'est-à-dire que vraiment on a des étudiants qui travaillent à la fois sur les modèles et sur l'empirique et qui font dialoguer et qui travaillent avec des gens qui sont, qui sont dans ces domaines-là. Et c'est ça que j'essaye de... C'est cette vision-là que j'essaye de, de pousser sur ces sujets. Et je crois que maintenant, voilà, et je vous encourage parce que la théorie c'est important, mais la thé faire de la bonne théorie c'est pas facile. Et, et je crois que c'est important de faire dialoguer autant qu'on peut la théorie et l'empirique, surtout qu'on a des données maintenant, on a accès à des données qui sont, c'est formidable l'accès à des nouvelles données, et il faut les explorer, et on peut faire tout de suite des choses, euh, des choses intéressantes. Par exemple, une chose qu'on fait également avec Céline et Juliette Colli, qui était une étudiante à l'école normale, que vous connaissez peut-être, que Laurent m'a envoyé, etc., qui est formidable, elle est à Stanford maintenant, on, on s'intéresse à la question suivante, la Chine, est-ce que la Chine fait de l'innovation frontière, ou pas est-ce que, est que, est que les brevets chinois sont vraiment fantastiques ou est-ce que c'est quand même pas ce qu'il y a de mieux Et, et est-ce qu'on a besoin de liberté pour avoir de l'innovation frontière ou pas Est-ce qu'on peut avoir de l'innovation frontière sans liberté Eh bien nous regardons cette question avec Juliette et, et Céline. Et voilà, voilà des, des gens de... Et on a les données pour faire ça maintenant. Donc euh, des données de citation, mais aussi on peut regarder... Vous voyez, dans les citations, on peut savoir qu'un brevet est très cité, mais on peut aussi regarder s'il si il emploie des mots, on peut regarder le contenu du brevet. Et on peut savoir est-ce que c'est un brevet très nouveau Est-ce qu'il utilise des mots que d'autres brevets avant utilisaient Ou est-ce que le brevet utilise des mots qui n'ont jamais été utilisés avant Ça, c'est des mesures beaucoup plus fines de, 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 de si vous voulez, de, du... De, du caractère novateur d'une innovation, vous voyez, et, et on peut maintenant faire ces analyses de texte, et, 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 et donc ça donne évidemment beaucoup plus d'informations sur la qualité et, et disons, la nouveauté d'une innovation, et le, et le caractère fondamental ou pas fondamental d'une innovation. Et donc voilà, on a tous ces, toutes ces choses qu'on fait, et donc voilà un petit peu, voilà un petit peu de, voilà, je raconte un peu ce que, que j'ai fait, ce que je fais avec les plus jeunes, et puis finalement, euh, je suis schumpeterien, et ma vision, c'est que les jeunes, ce sont ma, ils sont ma, ma destruction créatrice à moi, vous voyez, ils vont mieux que moi, et ils vont me rendre un ils vont me rendre déjà euh, obsolète et, et c'est ce que je cherche à faire c'est que les, les jeunes doivent être meilleurs que moi et doivent faire mieux que moi voilà, j'ai terminé merci merci beaucoup euh, maintenant je laisse euh, le Stiglitz euh, le soin de parler 15 minutes uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, and what I'm going to do uh, is, is try to lay out a, a broad landscape of uh, various areas. I'm going to begin with uh, the new views about the nature of the individual, and then I'll go to microeconomics, uh, general equilibrium, uh, macroeconomics, and then finally uh, make uh, some remarks about globalization. And uh, I think some of the things that I'm going to be talking about will be, what? Yeah. Okay. Uh, some of the things I'm going to be talking about will be uh, repeated by, by uh, uh, or taken up in greater detail by, by uh, the other people in the panel. So I'm going to begin about the nature of the individual. Uh, the model of the fully rational individuals with fixed preferences Uh, that they're born with, uh, I think provides an inadequate description of the individual. And uh, economic models that are based on uh, that model of the individual are likely to provide a poor description, and the policies derived from that model are likely to provide poor policy guidance. And some of this picks up with uh, remarks that were made in the very beginning, uh, which is that even though economics is a social science, many of the aspects of the way we formulated uh, economics is as if people were not social uh, human beings. Um, so uh, one of the big advances in, I think, in, in, in economics in the last 40 years is uh, behavioral economics. That is a deviation from that standard model of the rational individual. 
But most of those advances in the latter part of the 20th century were taking insights from psychology and talking about cognitive limitations. Uh, they didn't take on board the nature that uh, the fact that we are social uh, beings and that our preferences are endogenous and that in many ways who we are is shaped by our society and who we are shapes society. So you can think about this as a general equilibrium where there's an interaction between individuals and society uh, in, a, in a very complex way and there's some very interesting work on, in trying to model these uh, interactions. Um, in some ways, this is uh, an attempt to incorporate not just psychology, but insights from sociology and from social psychology. But it's a fundamentally different approach from the way sociology approaches, because they don't talk about the endogeneity of society. They don't talk about the interactions between individuals. They don't talk about general equilibrium. Uh, uh, nature of uh, uh, social preference determination. And I think this kind of theory helps to explain both social change and societal rigidities. And uh, it is uh, of particular relevance to development economics. And uh, there is a branch now, something developing, uh, called uh, behavioral development economics. Uh, the 2015 World Development Report of the World Bank sort of laid out some elements of, of this. A and, and it is, I think, a, a very big transformation in our, in our thinking in this area. Moving from the individual to microeconomics, uh, it's obvious that microeconomics, as well as every other branch of economics, is based on the nature of the individual, and if we start changing our view of the individual, we're gonna get mi uh, different microeconomics. There are a couple of other things that I want to talk about. The first is that the basic competitive paradigm, which is where you begin most uh, textbooks, uh, I think provides a poor description of a modern capitalist economy. Uh, market power, monopoly power is pervasive. If you want to explain what is going on in the American economy uh, particularly, you have to begin with some notions of imperfections in product markets, labor markets, and capital markets. Uh, and uh, in some way, uh, the, the course I teach in perspectives and economics to our uh, required course to our PhD students begins with uh, the uh, discussion of the nature of the individual, but then goes on to ask the question, uh, how do we reconstruct uh, our view of, econo of the economic system from the perspective that there are systemic and systematic deviations from competition? So uh, rather than waiting to the end of the course and talk about what a world with imperfect competition looks like, it's really at the core of understanding, and it's really important in labor economics where it's well accepted, but not in other areas. Um, once you take this view, part of the research agenda is trying to understand what are the barriers to competition, and what are the policies that are, uh, uh, might make markets uh, more competitive. Um, but it's also the case that this different perspective colors all the other areas of economic research. So one important area that uh, I've been involved in for a long time is uh, t public uh, taxation. And the key issue is what is the incidence of any tax? That is, who bears the tax? But who bears the tax is going to differ very markedly in a competitive environment and a non-competitive environment. So uh, the good news is for graduate students, uh, you can start every question that's been asked in economics, you can ask again from the perspective of what does a world look like in a, a world without uh, a competition. Uh, and that's also true for the next point on the slide there, which is corporate governance matters. Uh, the uh, simple models that we use always begin with the assumption that firms are value maximizing. Uh, but we know that's not true, uh, and uh, we know that 
the management makes a difference, uh, uh, how they're, th they aren't maximizing shareholder value, they're, max they're doing something else, and the legal frameworks uh, uh, have changed over time. Uh, at one time, corporations, uh, say in the United States, had a much broader perspective. And then under the influence of Milton Friedman, they became much more narrow on shareholder value maximization. But now they're moving again to a broader view of what corporations ought to do. And that makes a difference uh, for uh, behavior. Um, there's not a consensus on the alternative framework. And again, the policies such as tax incentives may have markedly uh, different uh, impacts. Uh, another aspect of microeconomics, which uh, I didn't fully understand everything that Philippe said, um, but I'm sure it was very uh, clear, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I'm sure he talked about innovation. Did I forecast? Yes. <laughs> so uh, I think innovation is central, uh, and uh, it is uh, what we always talk about, innovation economy, but the economics of innovation is markedly different from the economics of producing steel or, or manufactured goods or even services. And that means you really have to think about it in a very uh, different way. And there's been progress. Philippe's work has been very important, but the, 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 there is a lot more uh, that uh, uh, needs to be done. And finally, um, my own work was on the economics of information. And I talked about the existence of uh, asymmetries, natural asymmetries of information in my own work. But I didn't focus on a problem that our society is now facing, which is the problem of disinformation. Uh, the, the issue of people deliberately lying. And uh, uh, how, do, how does that affect behavior? Uh, and what are the rules of our society? If they can uh, decide who to communicate with and they can communicate different messages to different people, um, uh, that changes uh, the way economic systems uh, behave. So the notion that uh, it is very important for an economy and, and analyzing the economy to talk about flows of information has been well recognized. That, uh, but we, we haven't thought as much as we should about the nature of the, uh, of the communication links, the endogeneity of those communication links, and the fact that you can uh, not only tell the truth, but you can also tell a lie. And uh, that has become, I think, a much more central question in our society, particularly with the social media. Moving on to general equilibrium, that's the notion of trying to describe how the whole economic system works. And it's obvious the case that if you think, uh, have a different view of the individual, if you have a different view of microeconomics, uh, you, you come up with a different view of how the whole economic system works. So the important work on general equilibrium, say uh, began, beginning with Valrat, uh, De Bru, and Arrow, we're all based on a particular view of markets, competitive and the individual, which is this rational individual. And now we have to reconstruct, I think, general equilibrium. One particular question that I think is uh, uh, central is how do we explain the massive increase in inequality? And what are its economic, political, and social consequences? Uh, that, the topic of, of inequality uh, was not included at all in uh, any of the courses that I took a as a graduate student. And yet, uh, it's clearly a, a central issue for our society, and economics has a lot to uh, uh, say about uh, explaining that. And it's more than just skill premiums. Uh, it's more than uh, the simple models of, of uh, supply and demand uh, which uh, suggests. So uh, that, I think, is a, a, a one of the key issues uh, that we uh, have to face. We live in a society in which there is far greater complexity than suggested by the models with only government and the market. There are a whole set of other institutions like cooperatives, not-for-profits, and 
uh, I think one of the questions, uh, both from a policy point of view and, and, and from a descriptive point of view, is uh, where the, how do the, how do our society, our economy behave with these different kinds of institutions? Um, and what are the circumstances in which these different institutional arrangements work best? Um, and how do we design an economic system in which these different institutional arrangements interact in the best manner? So again, uh, 40 years ago, there was a big uh, subject called comparative economic systems. But that focused on the comparison between socialism, communism, and the market economy. And after the collapse of uh, communism, the subject of comparative economic systems disappeared. And what I'm suggesting, it ought to reappear, but we, in a different light. We're, we're now going to be talking about different forms, the role of welfare state, different forms of organizing our so, uh, society uh, in terms of uh, di uh, uh, different kinds of uh, institutional uh, arrangements. Within even the market economy, uh, traditional economic teaching hasn't focused very much on the details of the rules that govern. There's a small branch called law and economics that talks about liability law or one, you know, a, a very narrow aspect of law and economics. But the laws of our society really structure our economy. And uh, I've already mentioned one aspect, corporate governance, but there are lots of other aspects like bankruptcy law. The fact that in the United States, uh, if you borrow to uh, get an education, and our education system is so expensive, you, uh, a very large fraction have to borrow, uh, and, and students here should appreciate the fact that the average student in America graduates with a $25,000 debt. The student debt is $1.5 trillion. So uh, I hope you uh, uh, take advantage of the fact that your government is giving you a free or almost free education and you work very hard uh, in response to that uh, large uh, gift. But the, the, the fact is that uh, our students, uh, they can't discharge that debt even in bankruptcy. So President Trump can engage in a lot of uh, debt and go bankrupt over and over and over again. But if you're a student, you can't get rid of that debt. You might say, that's a terrible system, and you're right, but you have to analyze the consequences of different bankruptcy uh, laws. Um, a very important issue, both in Europe and the uh, United States, is the activities of the state can occur at many different levels, it's called fiscal federalism. And uh, in Europe, you talk a lot about subsidiarity, but there isn't a clarity of the views about how you ought to allocate the functions of the state across uh, different uh, levels. Uh, and then finally, we often think of collective action mostly in terms of state, whether it's federal, locals, regional, but there's a lot of other forms of collective action. Unions are a form of collective action. Class action suits are a form of collective action. And uh, in the United States, there has been a systematic attempt to undermine the ability of individuals to get together to engage in collective action. It's been part of the agenda of the right. Uh, and that what that means is to give more power to corporations and undermine the power of individuals, changing the bargaining power within our society. So that, I think, is also uh, an important topic. Um, in a way, macroeconomics is a specialization of general equilibrium theory where you focus on simplifying the general equilibrium model to make predictions about certain aggregates. Uh, aggregates like unemployment, GDP, and uh, the standard models that have predominated in economics, uh, 
un at least until 2008, and, and their survival characteristic amazes me because they should have been discredited, are the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, DSG models. And I believe very strongly that they failed. Uh, they provide an inadequate descrip uh, description of the economy, an inadequate tool for forecasting, and an inadequate framework for policy. So there's a need for an alternative macroeconomics. Uh, we actually have most of the required ingredients. And uh, the research agenda focuses on what are the key simplifying assumptions, what are the uh, uh, really bad assumptions. And uh, Roger was, will talk more about some aspects of that uh, in terms of, uh, say, rational expectations. Let me mention just a couple uh, aspects. Uh, one aspect that's, to me, very clear is that the economy is often not in equilibrium. So uh, I've been working on constructing a dynamic sta stochastic general disequilibrium model. And we see obvious examples of that. It's not only momentary equilibrium, where you have unemployment, and not just because of wage rigidity. You know, there's a political agenda in a lot of the macro models. If you, bl if you say that the reason you have unemployment is wage rigidity, what is the answer? Lower wages. That's a political agenda. And can you imagine, you talk about unemployment in the United States, wages at the bottom in the United States are the same level that they were 60 years ago. And to say, if you, when you have unemployment, the response is supposed to be to lower them so that the same level as they were 100 years ago, that's not going to be a very good response. And I think it's wrong. So the problem is not the wage rigidity, but there are other aspects, including the dynamics of adjustment. So there's both an absence of momentary equilibrium and an absence of intertemporal equilibrium, the absence of a full set of risk mar uh, 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 markets going into the future. There's almost no way you could have a full general equilibrium. A second issue I think is very important is that our society, our economy, is in the process of a, a structural transformation from manufacturing to service, uh, from uh, a manufacturing to innovation economy. There's a demographic transition, a climate transition that's absolutely critical. So we're going through a number of important uh, structural transformations. Markets on their own don't do this very well, but the macroeconomics of structural transformation are totally different from a dynamic stochastic general equilibrium, where you have enough uh, data that you can, your subjective probabilities are in accord with relative frequencies. Uh, we, don't, we haven't had those kinds of transformations over and over again, so you just don't have the data. Uh, and that's true with any innovation that's a true innovation. So once you start thinking about an innovation economy, the DSG models just make absolutely uh, no sense at all. Uh, another area is that when there are differences in views and the notion of, you know, there are always differences of view, the, the assumption that there are is called common knowledge and the, the conditions under which you have common knowledge are very restrictive. It gives rise to what I call pseudo wealth. People can make bets, will make bets with each other, and that they both believe that they're going to win. And when they don't win, there's a destruction of this fake wealth or pseudo wealth that they have, and that can give rise to uh, volatility. And finally, uh, a big issue that was exposed in the 2008 crisis was systemic risk, uh, the collapse of. Uh, uh, Lehman Brothers led to uh, a whole financial crisis. And that has uh, given rise to a lot of work in networks. And uh, I mentioned in the very beginning social networks, and these are another aspect of, of economic networks. And there have been a big advances in this, but it's, it's still a, a, a relatively new area, which I think is uh, very, uh, very exciting. So finally, uh, let me, uh, my time is up, so let me just mention on globalization. And uh, I'm sure Danny is going to talk more about this, but uh, there's one topic on the slide I want to mention, which is uh, 
at the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union, uh, there was a moment where there was a belief, which is called by Francis Fukuyama, the end of history, that we would all be converging to liberal democracies and market economies, free market economies. We know that's not true. And so we now know we'll be living in a world in which different economies operate under different rules with different values and in which there may be uh, very strong conflicts of power, not only economic but, but political power. And the question uh, that uh, a number of us have been worrying about, and Danny's been worrying about it a lot, is in such circumstances, how can we best obtain the benefits of the gains from trade, cooperation with competition, keeping in mind the long run consequences? So, thanks a lot, uh, Professor Stiglitz, for this intervention. And now uh, the floor is for Professor Rodrik. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. It's, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here, and it's, it's, um, it's just wonderful to be in, in, in such uh, distinguished uh, and great uh, company. Um, uh, I'm reminded of, of um, this wonderful um, quote from Isaiah Berlin, it was a, um, the British philosopher who said that there are two kinds of, of thinkers, um, the, and, and um, he, he called them foxes and hedgehogs, and he said, um, the fox knows uh, many things, the hedgehog knows one big thing. Um, and um, I've, I've always argued that, that ec economics needs um, uh, fewer uh, hedgehogs and more foxes. Not in the sense that we should not really fixate on big ideas, big solutions that always work everywhere, um, but um, have uh, economists uh, essentially be the foxes of, of having lots of different ideas and lot, lots of different um, uh, frameworks to work, work with that they apply contextually. I think we've just, uh, um, and I've often used actually Joe Stiglitz and Philippe Aguillon as my examples of, uh, of foxes, the great foxes of, um, uh, the economics uh, discipline. By the way, it was great to listen to Philippe uh, speaking in French, uh, because at Harvard we um, uh, we joke that uh, when when Philippe uh, uh, lectures in English, it's, it's just like his French, um, and and now and now now that I heard him in French, it's just like his English. Um, so uh, the. Um, but I'll, I'll, in, in my own comments, uh, um, despite what I've just said and despite my preference for foxes over hedgehogs, I'm actually going to be a bit of a hedgehog and I'm just going to uh, uh, talk a little bit about my, my, uh, my current fixation, uh, which is really about um, uh, the problem of, of good jobs and where will good jobs come from. Um, I think this is uh, really the, the, the main um, the crux of the matter today in terms of the challenges that our societies, both uh, advanced economies as well as developing countries are facing. Um, there has been uh, a, a number of uh, underlying trends. Um, uh, Deindustrialization in the advanced countries, uh, premature deindustrialization in the developing countries um, that, has, uh, uh, that have um, led to the reduction or the shrinkage uh, of formal employment uh, in the institutionalized parts of the labor market. Um, uh, um, other aspects of technological change, um, automation, um, skill bias technological change, uh, which have also gone in the same direction in the advanced countries in terms of shrinking those uh, employment in those sectors that, that are the best position to take advantage of these new technologies, much greater gap opening up between those innovative, um, uh, really well-performing, high productive parts or the sectors and the rest of the economy and much lower dissemination of the benefits of technology and innovation to large parts uh, of employment in, in the rest of the economy. A division between insiders and outsiders, uh, partly fostered in the labor market, partly fostered by uh, reforms on the welfare state, the institutionalization of labor markets, um, and of course uh, the process of, of globalization, increasing competition with countries like China, other low-cost exporters, uh, which have uh, adversely affected 
employment uh, in large parts of not just the advanced countries, but also many developing countries uh, that haven't been able to develop the kind of strong comparative advantage in those sectors that many East Asian countries like China have. So there's a, there is a, um, a, a global phenomenon of uh, dual, dualization, uh, 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 you know, dualistic uh, exas exacerbation of dualism in labor markets, the, the, um, the, the polarization of labor uh, markets um, and jobs, uh, which um, has had the um, somewhat interesting consequence that um, somebody like me who spent most of his research career really work, um, worrying about problems of developing countries. Now when I look at the advanced countries, I see it's exactly the same kind of problem that advanced countries are now facing in terms of these polarized dual labor markets and the problems of in integrating labor markets. Uh, so there has been a, a funny sort of convergence, if you will, but not the kind of convergence that we would want, convergence to above, uh, but somewhere sort of convergence uh, to, to below. Um, so my, um, most of my uh, recent work and, and, and worrying has been really about thinking about this, this general problem um, and, and, and what kind of policy and institutional arrangements um, might uh, address these issues. Um, so let me just uh, talk a little bit about sort of where my, my current uh, uh, thinking is and how it relates to, to basic uh, economics. I think the starting point uh, of, uh, of, of, of this problem is to, st to start thinking as an economist and think about the absence or the s relative scarcity of good jobs essentially as a large scale negative externality for society. Um, why is this a negative externality? Uh, because the absence of good jobs provides um, huge costs uh, to society and local communities. Uh, we see the effects in terms of um, the social costs. Uh, when good jobs disappear in communities, we observe that uh, families tend to get bre broken up, uh, drug, drug abuse increases, criminality increases, suicides uh, increase. Uh, we see the, the consequences uh, more broadly in terms of political effects. Um, and one of the um, common threads running through the literature on the empirical determinants of the rise of far-right authoritarian populist movements, uh, whether it's Trumpism in the United States or whether it is um, the, the various far-right parties you're familiar with in Europe, is that regardless of whether you look in Britain, in Germany, France, uh, Sweden, or the United States, uh, labor market problems, uh, increasing insecurity, uh, um, uh, labor market anxiety is what I would call again, the disappearance of good jobs uh, seems to be very strongly um, and causally linked, uh, sometimes driven by trade shocks, as in the case of the China trade shocks, sometimes driven by technological change and automation. Uh, but labor markets are a key intermediating uh, aspect of this phenomenon. And finally, even much more worrying in terms of the long-term consequences uh, is that we now also have now studies that show uh, that the disappearance of uh, good jobs uh, locally can breed, can generate uh, um, an increase in authoritarian values. Uh, that is, um, an, an increase for preference for authoritarian leaders. Um, and that, of course, is the more, probably the most damaging because it might entail long-term effects uh, that might be very difficult uh, to, uh, to reverse. Um, how do we, if we think about this then in terms of as a, as a gross uh, um, uh, a negative externality, um, we also um, reach another conclusion, which is that dealing with um, these labor market problems and the relative scarcity of good jobs uh, is not just a matter of uh, inequality or inclusion. It's also a matter for economic performance, overall economic performance. So uh, looking at the question from the perspective of good jobs uh, makes you, forces you to join the problem of uh, um, inclusion and inequality with the problem of economic performance and prosperity and economic growth. So if you ask the question, what's the best way we can make the economic grow in the advanced countries today, um, 
one of the most effective ways is actually going to be to, in, to encourage and to stimulate the dissemination of frontier technologies uh, to sectors that are actually lagging and lagging much further behind today than they were. So inclusion also creates overall prosperity, creates uh, uh, the, the, the benefits of um, uh, uh, productivity and technology more, more, more broadly. I think um, when, what are the remedies to this negative externality? Um, uh, I think th the standard uh, remedy for a negative externality, of course, is a, is a Pigovian um, tax or subsidy. Uh, in the case we have a negative externality, you might think that uh, the answer is going to be um, a, a subsidy for employment creation. Um, and uh, the problem with, with this is, um, and that's what sort of this one slide that I have is really about, uh, is that when you think about the problem of good jobs, it becomes, that it, it becomes clear that it's something that has to, deal, to, to be dealt with very much in, on, on the basis of uh, territorial, regional, or place-based policies that has to be very sensitive to local context, that has to be disaggregated, it has to be heterogeneous. Um, and in other words, it requires a response, uh, 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 a policy approach um, that is really high dimensional rather than low dimensional. The usual kind of Pigovian approach to an externality presumes uh, that you know the externality, where it is, you know the activity that's associated with the externality, uh, you know that um, the size of the externality, um, and that the environment is relatively static. Uh, then the Pigovian policy works. Once you start to generalize from that, even for example when you add a little bit of an uncertainty into the framework, uh, that you don't know about the magnitude of the externality, you're not sure about the costs um, of, of adjustment uh, to firms or whoever else you're dealing with, then already we have, for example, the famous result of Marty Weitzman uh, that sometimes you might prefer a quantity target rather than a price intervention. And you, but you can, in, you can enlarge that and to think that if in fact there is very large degree of uncertainty about in any particular community or setting um, what exactly is a good job, how will you define it, um, that might require targets or objectives that are continuously revised, monitored, uh, iterated. What are the best ways uh, to deal, to, to interact with firms and get them to actually invest in new job creation, what kind of training invest um, in, in, in education is needed? Uh, you start with a lot of ex ante uncertainty. What kind of instruments are going to be required? How do you learn actually about the capacity uh, of the state or the local governments to, to do this? So I would suggest that when you think about this, and, and, and the evidence uh, with, with place-based policies in the United States, for example, with regard to um, uh, attracting investment or workforce development, is that the best policies are those that do not work uh, in the kind of an ex, ex ante subsidy that's provided to investors or to employers, but much more of an iterative, collaborative process that sets provisional targets at the outset, uh, refines and revises those targets on the um, uh, on the basis of information that is recovered. It's collaborative with uh, a bunch of um, uh, participants, firms, uh, trainers, community colleges, community groups, local, govern go local governments, um, and then is open to revision of targets and instruments as time goes on. Um, and it does not presume, like the Pigovian approach um, or the principal agent framework uh, in which we usually think of regulation, does not presume a given capacity on the part of the government. Uh, it doesn't presume a, a given information structure. Uh, it, it only presumes that both capacity can be built over time uh, through this iterative collaboration, and also that um, uh, various channels of information can be enriched over time. The information structure uh, is, is, is not given as in the standard principal agent framework. What I'm describing to you is in many ways uh, a kind of, of industrial policy. Um, although the practice of it is very different from the type of, of industrial policy that we think about it in a traditional way. And that's what the slide really tries to highlight. I, I've, I've, I've distinguished uh, between sort of what's a, a the traditional kind of industrial policy and the more modern productivist approach uh, targeted at, at, good, um, at, at good jobs or employment creation 
uh, that that I've um, I've been um, um, uh, I've been thinking about and developing. Uh, doing this mostly with um, uh, Chuck Sable from Columbia Law School, but but um, others as well. Uh, so in the traditional framework, essentially, as you can you can read it for yourself, essentially there's the the presumption that govern government knows where the market failures are, uh, but the government is prone to capture. Therefore, you have a system of regulation that's sort of at arm's length um, on a principal agent model. Whereas under sort of this, this modern approach, uh, you presume that in fact there is this, this, this high dimension of uncertainty that's evolving, but information can be recovered. State capacity is endogenous and trust uh, among the participants in this process uh, does not need to be presumed. It can be built over time and so forth. So all of this you know, just um, sounds uh, in, in, in many ways uh, perhaps intuitively appealing, but also highly abstract. Um, the question is whether um, any of this is actually works or, or we have evidence of this. It turns out that, that uh, even though economists have not been paying much attention, that many modes of regulation or industrial policy today in the world uh, operates under this modern framework. Uh, but that this, is, this has largely evaded uh, uh, the, the attention of, of, of economists, partly because it's much harder to evaluate uh, with the kind of empirical tools that economists have, and that's indicated in the, in the last column uh, in, this, in, in this table. Um, uh, for example, uh, most of the recent success in industrial policy around the world does not come from Korean type, uh, you know, government from the top picking winners and deciding which sectors are going to get credit subsidies and which not. It instead um, uh, emerges from these collaborative practices where government or agencies of the government are engaged in sort of round table sectoral dialogues with different parts of the private sector, uh, devoted to finding out where the constraints are, what the government can do to remove those constraints. An example listed here is, is the ex experience of Peru uh, in diversifying into non-traditional agricultural products. Uh, there are similar examples, for example, in agriculture in Argentina, a country that has been famously lousy at doing traditional uh, uh, industrial policy, but has been very successful in agri agriculture with this much more collaborative kind of an approach. The United States, uh, of course, which is said to abhor industrial policy and not practice it, is full of industrial policy of the second kind. Um, the famous DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, its more recent uh, incarnation in the area of uh, environment, green technologies, ARPA-E, it's all organized under the same, this, this kind of a approach of, of uh, uh, getting people from the private sector to serve temporarily in the government to lead projects uh, that are highly uncertain ex ante. Now what's different with I'm, what I'm suggesting uh, is that none of these real world examples that I'm just referring to and may, there are many others, uh, really focus on this key challenge uh, primarily of good jobs. Um, and I think that will have to be the key Sometimes they focus on environmental uh, regulation. Sometimes it's about um, sort of generating more productive firms or more international competitiveness, subsidizing frontier innovation. None of them directly targets uh, uh, good jobs. And I think given the magnitude of that challenge, given how large that negative externality is in terms of economic, social, and political costs, I think this will have to be a primary uh, focus of, of policy in the future, and necessarily much of this is going to have to be experimental. But we can think about some governance principles that's going, some institutional design principles that can shape uh, the kind of experiments that we want to run uh, in, the, in the policy world, um, and, and this is why I'm a hedgehog these days. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Rodrik, for the intervention. And now, uh, Roger Gonnery, uh, you have, yes, this one. Hello. I think I will speak English because my French is not easy to understand. <laughs> <laughs> my English is easy to understand, uh, at least uh, f even for Joe. <laughs> so, we are, su suppose, we are supposed to talk about uh, frontier self-economic research. We'll talk about frontiers in expectational coordination. Why? When you, do economic, when you try to understand the economic world, you have to understand how people react to present signals, 
but how they react to future signals, to what will happen tomorrow. Okay. So expectations are a very important part of the explanation. Uh, so the, the, the present... Oh. So, uh, naturally, uh, I, uh, rationality of expectation was a direction for reflection after the crisis. I was uh, interested in the different number of uh, direction for reflection, the balkanization of knowledge, but that, that would be a subject in itself. The questioning economic economicus rationality, uh, just has spoken about that, uh, and it has led to the development of behavioral economics and the rationality of expectation which is different, which is my point. Recent theory has been dominated by the rational expectation hypothesis. Uh, it's associated with an article by Moose in 1961, which argued that the agents were considering the relevant economic theory. They were as clever as the economists, and their view of the future was based on the relevant economic theory. Okay, so that means in particular that agents do not make systematic mistakes. They make the best prediction compatible with their information. For those who are not economists, I will give an example of what is a rational expectation equilibrium, a rational expectation view of, the, of a market. You have uh, people today that have decided to the size on their size of their crop. They will sell their crop tomorrow, one, one year from now, and there will be a price tomorrow, and they are concerned with the price at which they will sell their crop. Uh, and uh, tomorrow they know that the, the demand will take place tomorrow will be downward sloping. Okay? It will be a quantity that will be demanded will decrease when the price increase. No, naturally, producers are concerned with the price tomorrow and their total supply, if they, were, if they knew the expected price, Okay, if, if they had all the same view of the price tomorrow, it will be S of P, supply curve. And what is rational expectation is that uh, producers pr predict, all producers here that have decided on the size of their crop, produce, predict that will, uh, the price P star will occur. P star is the price of that S of P star equal D of P star. Uh, naturally, it's a prediction, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you all predict that, then the peop people will put on the market the quantity S of P star that is uh, required, and the price tomorrow will be D of P star. Here, you have no noise, so it's a perfect foresight. Agents have perfect foresight on what will happen. Uh, and naturally, it's a prediction of the relevant economic theory. Uh, if you define the relevant economic theory by the one I have mentioned here, uh, you might have different economic theory. Question. So the question is associated with a quotation from a letter of Poincaré to Valras in 1901. Okay, I will translate into English. <laughs> Vous faites l'hypothèse que les agents sont infiniment égoïstes. You assume that the agent is infinitely selfish, which is probably acceptable, which is sans doute acceptable en première approximation, which is. But also, you assume that they are infinitely clairvoyant, which is much more debatable. <laughs> That's a good criticism. Uh, I will uh, go on that. Now, natural expectation have not taken a great room in the theory until uh, recently. You have, uh, you have no much expectation in Valras. When you read Keynes, you you read about the beauty contest, okay, where people have to find the, the most beautiful uh, flower, and uh, they, have to guess, they have to guess the most beautiful flower will be given by a vote, and you have to understand, you have to try to understand what the others think that they are the best beautiful flower. Uh, so it's called the beauty contest. You have also uh, expectational coordination uh, discussion in X on IEC. Uh, but now the rational expectation hypothesis, as I mentioned it, agents refer to the econ relevant economic theory 
has taken over the number of fields in economics, general equilibrium, uh, specialized field, industrial organization, trade, finance, macroeconomics, overlapping generation model, RBC model, DGSC model, as uh, emphasized by Joe, and even in new, model called New Keynesian, which have rational expectation, but friction is a pricing procedure, you have rational expectation. So the question, the issue is, what, was Poincaré right? Okay. The first remark that you can make is that the success may be due to clever rhetoric and vocabulary. Okay. Uh, economists like rationality, okay. so they like to have a rational agent, and uh, a number of them have believed that rash it's rational to have rational expectations. And that's not true. It's rational to have rational expectations if others have rational expectations. If others have not rational expectations, it's not rational to have rational expectations. Okay, it's called uh, in our terminology a Nash, in game theoretical terminology, a Nash hypothesis, which is different from the rationality hypothesis. So the question is it a deux machina, a reasonable assumption, or a rather blind point of economic theory, as I will argue. Now I will uh, give a few insights on the direction of critical assessment of the rational expectation hypothesis, what has been made by in the, re in the recent research. I distinguish between internal criticism, internal criticism means it's a Marxist vocabulary of the 50s, Okay, internal criticism means you believe in the model, but you, you are asking questions within the model. And internal criticism here amounts to saying, what is the relevant theory if there are many? Or what is the rational expectation equilibrium to take into account if you have several of them? Okay, and there have been a literature in which I have been involved with some of uh, quotes from my, my co-author here, uh, that have put emphasis on sunspot equilibrium. Sunspot equilibrium has equilibria that are triggered by belief that are a priori uh, uh, irrelevant, that the, the, the price will depend on the sun, there is sunspot or no sunspot, and that this, but this belief has their fulfilling in a number of models. Okay, conversely, in some cases, multiplicity appears as an artifact for simplistic modeling of the global games with Maurice and Sheen. And internal criticism at the different dimension, you have earth behavior. Earth behavior is that people decide following, they have to decide sequentially. You have to go to a restaurant. First, uh, Danny goes to a restaurant. We have all the same information. Uh, then Philip, we have no information, follows him. Then uh, I, had inf I had the contrary information. I followed both of them because I think that they have received uh, good information and Joe follows us, whatever the information he gets, okay? Uh, so, so it's called uh, herd behavior, etc. cetera, for, for, for aggregation of information. I have also, I have been internal, inter there is also what I call external criticism, which is uh, arguing, uh, t t considering criticism, criticizing the concept, uh, question on the expectational robustness of the equilibrium, okay? Uh, Rational expectation equilibrium is such that if everybody believes the, the rational expectation equilibrium, then it takes place, at least uh, stochastically. Okay. Uh, I have been involved. There, there, so people have looked at real-time learning. Okay, in, you are in a world in which uh, our farmers, at each time, look at the price that has happened yesterday. They change their view of the future sequentially, slowly. And the question, does it converge to the rational expectation equilibrium? That's real-time learning, the bounded rationality viewpoint. And uh, I have been interested in what I call, what is a call uh, inductive viewpoint, which is a critical assessment of the motion arg argument of uh, rationality, of the common knowledge of aggregate action. So it has a game theoretical background, but uh, uh, critical, in fact, uh, in, in real terms, it's put emphasis on the elasticity of realization to expectation. Okay, if, if, if what you do is not very sensitive to expectation, it will be much easier to, to, 
connect on a rational expectation equilibrium. If it's very sensitive to expectation, then it will be much more difficult. Okay, there are also external, all those type of external criticism. Yes, I, here I mentioned that uh, I was involved in a network that was international network on expectational coordination. There were uh, 12 poles with plus Paris, uh, with Princeton, Columbia, NYU, Stanford, Oregon, Santiago de Chile, Zurich, Amsterdam, Jerusalem, Tokyo, Beijing, and so on. It worked from uh, 2010 to 2014. And there, we, there was a confrontation of different lines, okay? Global games, self behavior, adaptive learning, experiments, okay? One way to check whether the rational expectation equilibrium is good is to go into experiment, okay? And to see whether people co to guess to, in an experiment, find the rational expectation equilibrium and they find something else, and deductive learning. Now, I will try to show you that uh, not, I, I don't claim naturally I won't make a, an over, I, I, I don't want to make a summary of what has been found or a, the, an, a, a formal argument, but I will give an example of a subject, uh, revisit problem and see how they can, this view can change your view of the problem. So uh, I will assume first more financial instruments is better, the efficient market hypothesis, after that long run coordination in the RBC model, DGSC model. Okay. And I will give you some view of uh, this critical view, this uh, external, internal criticism of rational expectation and hypothesis uh, change your view. The economic wisdom uh, on instruments is that uh, speculation is stabilizing and completing the markets, having new instruments is good. The standard wisdom of the performance of market is of the called efficient market hypothesis. The market transmits a lot of information, all the information, the extreme view. So you have a less extreme view, the markets are good information transmitter. On a less extreme view, you cannot beat the market, which is not synonym. And the, the, you have to know the third point is the standard wisdom on the long run encore. Uh, in the DGSC model, people uh, have a long, long horizon, and then you are, can argue that transversality condition discipline the long run. And it's, it's a model in which the permanent income hypothesis kills the Keynesian effect. New financial instrument. Uh, so I refer uh, many new financial instruments. There has been a development of new financial instruments as you know, uh, in the financial world uh, since the 1980s. So the rational is that they lower transaction costs, you have, uh, and they improve risk sharing. Okay, that's the case if you introduce an option. Okay, an option, you know what it is. Uh, and the question is that, uh, can they affect the plausibility of good expectational coordination? I will quote a paper I have written Unfortunately, he had 15 years before the crisis. Unfortunately, people have forgotten to read it, so we <laughs> uh, Charles Rocher. Uh, we look at the problem of inventory decision. You are today, you have to decide on the size of the inventory. You, 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 you are inventory holder. You have a capacity of inventorying, of, of, of getting, uh, having inventories. And naturally, you decide about the event of inventories depending on the size of the crop today and the expected size of the crop tomorrow. Okay, if you have a good crop today you, and you, you, you expect a bad crop tomorrow, you will, uh, you will uh, decide on a certain level of inventory. And now, uh, so you can write a small, very s simple model that explains that, how you decide on inventory that depends on the elasticity, on a certain number of elasticities and so on. Now what we have done in this, uh, we have introduced a new market, okay? We had first, in the first market, you have people who decide on inventories. They are the inventory holders, okay? And they decide on the basis of their expectation. And uh, they have rational expectation under some condition, if you wish, but they have rational expectation. And then you introduce a new market, a market for future. That means uh, all people in the 
population are able, can, can, can participate on the market and inventory. They can buy future of, the, of wheat tomorrow uh, and a future market that takes place today. Okay. Now, so, so, so you introduce the possibility of speculation in this market. Okay. Is speculation good? Uh, yes, there is a good, a robust argument due to Friedman in the sense that the price of the crop is decreased when you introduce this future market. The, the variance of the crop, the, the, the predicted price, the rational expectation price of the price that will take place, uh, will have a variance that is uh, that, 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 that is um, smaller when you introduce the future market. But however, uh, an index of the strength of expectational coordination, of robustness of expectational coordination, unambiguously decreases. So speculation is destabilizing in this sense. Okay, it was the title of our paper, specula destabilizing speculation. And it's rather spectacular because it makes people, it makes more, more difficult for people to predict what's going on tomorrow when, when you introduce this new market. And it has a potentially very large set of applications. Second point, uh, inf financial fragility, information transmission. So the conventional wisdom I just mentioned previously, reminder, financial markets are informationally efficient. The framework is that uh, to, 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 to describe this uh, idea, you refer to a model, as economists do, and they are right to do, if I understand uh, what uh, they need says, some time ago, uh, no, not at this session, but at the previous session. Uh, so in the model, you, you, you have, you have two types of agents, inform and inform agent and inform agent, and uh, people look at the, pri the, the price, and uh, when inform agent naturally in their demand uh, include the information they have, and the question is whether an information can, be, uh, can infer from the price uh, the good information. Uh, is the plausibility of good expect expectational coordination problem characteristics? Yes, the result. Uh, I, have a, I, re I refer to a paper with Grossman and Sigley, 1981, which says uh, in Nash, Bayesian Equilibrium, you have not perfect expectational coordination uh, in the sense that rational expectation, uh, the efficient market hypothesis is not lay, strongly verified. But uh, now, if you introduce uh, the critical view on rational expectation equilibrium, you find, I have a certain number of papers here, uh, you find that um, the equilibrium transmit information only when there is not much information to transmit. Okay, a too aggressive source of information kills seductive stability. Too much information cannot be transmitted. Uh, and that, that, that refers to the necessity of realization to expectation. Uh, if you, because if you are in, in the mental process you are considering, if you are uh, uh, if you have a loss of information and you believe that information transmits a loss of the market, you believe more the market than you. But then the market cannot transmit much, too much information because you, you believe it much more than you. Okay. Intuition, you cannot trust enough the market if the other also trust it. Trusting the market implies that little information is transmitted. Uh, one minute to the financial fragility, long live agent. I will give you. Uh, part of an article that have appeared in the Financial Times in March 2009, and it's a criticism of uh, the economist's view on financial markets. In financial markets, today's set price depend on tomorrow, there is anticipation of tomorrow's price, and tomorrow's price depend on tomorrow's expectation of the price the day after tomorrow, and I'm not there. Since there is no obvious finite terminal date for the universe, few macroeconomists study cosmology in their spare time, most economists model with rational asset pricing imply that today's price depends in part on today's anticipation of the asset price in the infinite remote future. Uh, what is right is his pamphlet. 
is a quintessential coordination taken as given as, as in long run horizon model. Paradoxically, it's a long run horizon model have been models in which more effort has been put in the understanding of the coordination issue. But there is a huge difference between uh, short run model with short run, people have short run horizon and model with long run horizon as in the DGSC. Okay. Uh, the long run life, life hypothesis is the key assumption of real business cycles in macroeconomics in DGSC. As I told, the permanent income hypothesis kills the Keynesian multiplier and the long life expectation kills the plausibility of good expectational coordination. I mentioned here the last paper I published in the good journal, economic journal, uh, which shows that uh, expectation coordination is impossible with long lived vision. Keynesian intuition is back, and is back through the window. So I, f I finish here. Uh, so we are back on what was an axiom at some time of economic theory. Plausibility of coordination is a sense of rational expectation is constant across situation. Okay, it's not explicit, but it's implicit. We have seen an objection. And this axiom, the invariant relevance of rational expectation hypothesis is strictly speaking unbelievable. What is unbelievable is not the rational expectation hypothesis. You have a cases in which you can find a very good story for why people coordinate on the future, on the common future. But its invariant possibilities with examine the world is completely unbelievable. So present theory is a special case of a more general theory that uh, you in the room will construct uh, in the last, uh, in the next uh, 25 years, maybe 30 years. Thank you. So, dear professor, thanks a lot for your all the inspiring uh, interventions. So, you were quite popular, so we had many questions. So, I tried my best to uh, at least to have probably to uh, resume it uh, in two different uh, questions. The, the first one, this is for all of you. Uh, the first one is you spoke many times about data, new data, individual data, survey data, firm data, and so on. But uh, I had few concerns about how this data may create some gap with other social science and also how economic research is able to, uh, to integrate all the qualitative uh, research. So I think, for example, now you know you have this uh, big data uh, fashion or revolution and some, some, there is the belief by some that now that you have the big data, you can dispense with theory that somehow the data will tell you what, what the relationships are. I, I believe that this view is wrong. I think you need theory. The theory is the glasses with which you look at the world. And of course the glasses you need to improve and the data will force you to improve your glasses and to modify. And I gave you the example of the competition and innovation and how by dialoguing with the Blondel, we arrive at a theory and, and empirics which was neither more sophisticated than the empirics they had and, and, and more complete than the theory that we had. And uh, uh, so I think you need, you need the dialogue between theory and empirics. I don't believe that the data will tell you the theory. I think that's, uh, but the data can guide you uh, uh, because you see models, you can expand models at infinitum. There are so it's important to know that some effects are first order or second order in under which circumstance. For example, when you have IO theory, you have effects in all directions. There are effects, counter effects, this effect. But you have no clue which effect dominates when. And there, the, the empirical analysis helps you. You can, you can, it can help tell you when is one effect dominating or when is the other effect. Or you can try to understand things. You see, for example, we know there is this big decline in productivity growth in the US. What was the reason for that? Is it because ideas are harder to get? Is it because interest rate went down and, and that had the kind of perverse effect on firm dynamics? Uh, is it because uh, mismeasurement? Or is it because something else, for example, the superstar firm? Only, you know, the empirics helps you because you get one fact with, together with other facts. And you say, well, you, you need a theory that matches the various facts. If I didn't have the empirics, I, I, any, all of these explanations would be fine. And you would have no idea. But on the other hand, the facts themselves alone 
you know, are not enough. You need, you need to get back to the theory. And, and same with inequality. You want to know what are the sources of top income inequality. Uh, is it just uh, rentier? Is it innovation? What are the implications that it's also innovation? If you don't have a theory there, you, uh, you are, it's very hard. You, see, you just say, okay, inequality went up. And, and my feeling is that some people, what they do sometimes, they, they look at data, then they get a theory, and they don't try to see if their theory is validated by the data. And then they make recommendations. Th that, I think, is not the way to do. You have to see, okay, you have a theory, but have you confronted your theory to the data you had? Or did you just put, did you do the, the empirics on one side? Did you do the theory on the other side? And you just put them together, and we have to believe the whole package. And, and you see, that, and that's, that's what I try to say, is that uh, I want, I think the dialogue is important. I think, uh, voilà, that's what I wanted to, so, so the problem with the data is that it's very, it's very tempting, you know, with all these data, it's very tempting to have great fun with the data. But you have to discipline yourself in the way you deal with the data. And that's where the dialogue with theory is important. So you need the theory, and, but also the data uh, discipline the theory. The, the, the theory discipline your way of approaching the data. But the data also discipline the theory because the theory, you can do theory like Lego game. You can increase theory, you can make zillions extension of a model. But maybe most of them are uninteresting and irrelevant. And, and the data helps you. And that's my own view. Thanks a lot. Okay. So, um, I think first I, I want to emphasize that, that uh, while we often talk about data, empirics is beyond data in, in a sense. So that, for instance, uh, you can reject a model that says there's no unemployment. You know, the RVC uh, makes a prediction that uh, demand for and supply of labor uh, are equal. You don't have to do a, a very fine-tuned regression to observe that there are, is significant unemployment. Uh, you have to interpret the data, but so the second uh, point uh, I want to make is that actually uh, you can test some of the ideas of the kind that uh, Roger uh, uh, raised uh, by asking, you know, like rational expectations and common knowledge. Uh, you can ask the question, uh, if we have survey data about what people's beliefs are, given all of the empirical information about aggregates in the past, do people's statements about, uh, do survey data add predictive, uh, 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 increase the predictability? Uh, do, they, do they show up significant? And the answer is unambiguously yes. And um, so you, you, you can then again see that that is a good, a simple test of rejecting uh, the rational uh, expectations hypothesis. Uh, the <coughs> common knowledge hypothesis you can reject by saying, if everybody had the same common knowledge, would they have, uh, they should have the same expectations. And you can test that also by survey data. So I think one of the things that you can use data, uh, this kind of data, is, is to reject uh, very quickly, certain hypotheses that are, are, are very strong. Um, one of the hardest questions in, in uh, macroeconomics is that there is a, a strong view that uh, modern macroeconomics is based on micro foundations. And then you look at the parameterizations that are used in standard macro models, like <laughs> constant relative risk aversion or constant elasticity utility functions. We can reject those because those have strong implications about the nature of savings and the nature of risk behavior, and we can reject those. And then you have to say, it takes a certain kind of cognitive dissonance to say, I have micro foundations, the micro foundation, you know, I've micro founded macroeconomics, but the micro foundations have been rejected by all micro uh, testing and still believe the macro. And it may be that they provide good macro implications, but it's not micro-founded. So I think you can do, you know, th th these are uh, examples of some of the things. Finally, one of the issues that <coughs> been uh, gotten a lot of attention recently <coughs> are um, RTCs, uh, ra random control trials. Um <coughs> and 
Uh, they're the kind of dialogue uh, that Philippe was talking about is very important. Um, you have to think, have a theory about what are the things that are important. There are an infinite mon uh, number of things that you could test, uh, but you don't have an infinite number of resources. You have to, so there was a, take one big issue, which is <coughs> microcredit. It's a very big development issue. Um, there was a lot of testing <coughs> of the <coughs> design of particular microcredit schemes. But the biggest failure of microcredit was in India. <coughs> and none of those uh, experiments told us why it failed. It failed because it was a for-profit and it was very hard to test the reaction of consumers, uh, of borrowers, to being for-profit or not-for-profit. And uh, uh, that turned out to be probably the most important uh, determinant. So thanks a lot. It seems that we are running uh, out of time, but uh, as you know, this is a, a track for, for students, basically. It was designed like that, and I had a few questions, and probably I can read it uh, one as it was uh, asked. just have to find it again. Uh, the question was, dear professors, what would be of each of you the advice to a 21th century graduate students who would like uh, to become a researcher? So if you have just 30 seconds each, to give uh, one advice for all of our students that are here today. Thank you. No advice. <laughs> well, I, uh, if I understand correctly, what's the advice to a 21-year-old student to be um, successful in economics, to, or to be, I should say, to be a good economics researcher? I, I would say that um, just invest in the tools, but read way beyond economics. No, 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 no. So I, I, I tend to agree with what Danny said. So. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I agree very much with what Danny said, but I think uh, I would say uh, two other things. One of them is. Um, you should focus on big issues, big problems. Uh, that's at least from the social return. Uh, that's not necessarily getting a job, uh, but in terms of what is important, I, I, I think it's really important to focus on big issues. And there's a temptation to, to look at very small things. There's a little bit about the hedgehog versus the fox, uh, but it's also a question of, uh, there are so many uh, really important issues like uh, inequality, uh, macro stability that uh, we talked about, uh, innovation, and uh, a lot of uh, economic research is, is not on, uh, I think, uh, all the important uh, issues. And I guess the other thing uh, I say is uh, you, it's, it's hard work. You have to not only master the tools, but uh, there's a lot of hard work. So. Uh, you should be passionate about uh, what you're doing and, and really uh, care about it uh, because uh, if you're going to work so hard, uh, uh, you ought to at least feel satisfied uh, yourself. Okay, thanks a lot uh, and uh, thanks for all your intervention. Thank you.